Before we start, I'd like to give a massive shout out to the following people for supporting Stories Telling Stories on Patreon. Jim Ross, Holly, Tamara, and Tom. Thank you so much for your support. If you'd like to help support the show and hear your name listed before future episodes, head on over to patreon.com slash stories telling stories. It is now August 1st. July has come and gone, and I took a meaningful and necessary break from the series, not to recharge my batteries, but because I'm an individual who has a painful relationship with the word no. I often overexert and overextend myself in some vain attempt to signify my worth to friends, family, and colleagues, as if saying no makes me ungrateful, undeserving, and unworthy of opportunity, advancement, gratitude, and ambition. Make no mistake, I love being busy. I love being creative. I love stimulating and rewarding activities. It's been the dream of my life to chase a creative endeavor that could translate to a rewarding and sustainable lifestyle without the shackles of a normal job. And I've been grinding away at this dream for the better part of 15 years, from music to playwriting, acting, directing, independent producing, audio engineering, you name it. The old adage goes, if you work hard enough, you will be rewarded and your dreams will be attainable that the only limitation is your own motivation. You are your biggest enemy, and if you don't have success to show for your labor, then you simply aren't working hard enough. I've lived this. I've breathed this. And I don't believe it for a second. I don't believe every hobby has to be a side hustle or that every hobby must become monetized. I was brought up under a strict philosophy of not wasting time and not squandering your money by the tough lessons imparted upon the greatest generation by the effects of the Great Depression. These are values that I still appreciate. Hard work, reliability, sticking by your word, a handshake being as valuable as a contract, They may be old-fashioned values, but they're still values nonetheless. But even the best intentions can and do lead to unintended ends when they're internalized and pushed too far. I took this break because my inability to say no wrapped me up in a project too big for its britches, to coin a phrase from my late grandfather which came to its end with an avalanche of responsibility dropped on my shoulders at the zero hour, requiring me to pull a 36-hour bender of constant work to meet an arbitrary yet inflexible deadline, some of which I even live-streamed over on Twitch to keep myself focused, awake, and working. To hold myself accountable. To finish my day job at 10 p.m., work through the night without sleep, and be finished in time to punch into my day job at 8 a.m. the next morning. A feat that I accomplished, but by the skin of my teeth, and that pushed my body, my motivation, and my mind to the breaking point. COVID aside, I put myself through the ringer six months out of the year, pulling 70 to 80 hour weeks between my real job and my dream job, which is volunteer. I wear an abundance of different hats and put in an ungodly number of hours, which, even after 13 years, I'm afraid to say no for fear of being seen as ungrateful and not good enough. That if I don't work myself to death, work harder than anybody else, show my sweat and my struggles and my insurmountable sleep debt, that I am not dedicated to the organization. I have not had a summer in the traditional sense in 13 years. Any vacation or summer retreat that I take is measured in hours rather than days, and often finds me driving through the night for a brief respite of celebration before diving right back into the grind. I don't blame anybody but myself for this. If you are unable to say no, how will anybody know if something is too much for you? And in that way, I am my own worst enemy. But the unintended effects of COVID and quarantine have meant free time during the summer months for the first time for me in over a decade. 
and spending a few frantic weeks in July wrapped up in what was otherwise typical summer workload for me opened my eyes to just how unsustainable and undesirable that lifestyle is for me. Because I'm not living. I'm barely surviving. I'm a half-conscious creature fueled by caffeine, stress, and anxiety for the benefit of a few faceless strangers willing to accept a free ticket to see some theater in the middle of nowhere. Working this heavy a load is not something I want to do anymore. It's quite literally going to kill me if I keep it up for another 13 years. And this is the revelation that my break has brought me. I've been able to discover new outlets for my creativity that I would have otherwise been unable to explore. I've gotten into streaming on Twitch twice a week. I've been playing music again, including a socially distant bar gig. And I've been paid for my efforts and been able to turn around and reinvest in my projects to make them even better. I, I feel optimistic. I feel creative. I feel that I may have a future in some sort of creative way after all. If I'm willing to give myself the time and the space to do what I want to do. I am my own worst enemy after all. Sometimes we all are. And only time will tell how far I can take that. And that translates into our story for this week. As we dive into the second half of season three of Stories Telling Stories with another episode of our ongoing series Locked in a Vacancy, The Naked Lady is a short story from a compilation of Southern American writers called The Cry of an Occasion, which was penned by Madison Smart Bell, who is a writer, professor, and essayist whose work has appeared in Harper's, The New York Review of Books, and The New York Times Book Review. And it's not often that we do a living author here on the show, but this is one of those rare occasions. The Naked Lady tells a story of heartbreak and friendship through the eyes of a good friend. And while this story, and the collection in which it was published, was in celebration of Southern voices, the themes it contains are universal, and my reading will be presented with a distinctly Northern flair. As you're aware, or may not be, I come from the great state of Vermont, a state with a distinct and identifiable accent that is grossly underrepresented in pop culture, with elements of our Irish, Scottish, and English heritage sprinkled amongst a surprisingly good old boy aesthetic as you venture off Route 100 and into the vacant expanses of Lamoille County and up into the Northeast Kingdom. An accent that I never wanted to develop, out of embarrassment and the lower class connotations it conveys, but one that I learned by ear nonetheless, thanks to countless hours spent with extended family, when I wasn't too busy to see them and being the one thing in my life where I would have to say no, I'm too busy. This is The Naked Lady by Madison Smart Bell on Locked in a Vacancy. This is a thing that happened before Monroe started making the heads. While he was still making the naked ladies. Monroe, he went to the college and it made him crazy for a little while like it had done to many a one. He about lost his mind on this college girl he had. He was, she was just a, a little old bit of a thin and, and she started talking like she had bugs in her mouth and, and she was nothing but trouble. So I never would have messed with her myself. When she thrown himself over, we had us a party to take his mind off her. Monroe had these rooms in an empty mill down by the railroad yard. He used to make his sculptures there, and we both live in there too at the time. We spent all the money on whiskey and beer and everybody we known to come over. When it got late, Monroe appeared to drop a stitch and went to throwing bottles at the wall. It's caused some people to leave, but others stayed on to, to help him, I think. So I had a bad case of the drunk myself. A little before sunrise, I crawled off, didn't wake up till way up in the afternoon. I had a sweat from sleeping with my clothes on. So the first thing I seen when I opened my eyes was this big old rat sitting on the floor beside the mattress. He had a look on his face like he was wondering if it'd be safe to come over and take a bite out my leg. 
It was one of the worst rats in that place you ever saw. I never saw nothing to match him for bold. If you chunk something at him, they just back off a ways and look at you mean. Monroe had this, this tin sink that was full of plaster from the sculptures, and, and every night these old rats would mess in it. In the morning, you could see they'd left tracks going places you wouldn't have believed something would go. We had this uh, this 22 pistol we used to shoot them up with, but it wasn't a whole lot of good. You could hit one of them rats square with a 22, and he'd go off with it and just get meaner. About the only way to kill one was if you hit him sprang in the head, and, and that means you got to be a better shot than I am most of the time. We did try a box of them uh, exploding 22s, like what that, that boy shot the president with. See, they take a rat apart if you hit him with it, but if you didn't, they'd bounce around the room and bust up the sculptures and, and so on. It happened. I had put this pistol in my pocket before I went to bed so Monroe couldn't get up to nothing with it. I'd taken it out slow and I threw it down this rat and he was looking me over. Hit him in the hind quarter and he went off a clang a pipe with one leg dragon. I sat up. I saw the fluorescence was on in the next room. I threw the door. When I went in there, Monroe was messing around with one of his sculpture stands. Did you get one? He said. Winged him, I said. That ain't worth much, Monroe said. He off somewhere now plotting your doom. I believe the noise hurt my head more than the slug hurt that rat, I said. Is there any whiskey left that you know of? Well, let me know if you find some, Monroe said. So I went to looking around. The place was nothing but trash, and it was glass all over the floor. I, I might have felt worse sometime, but I don't just remember when it was, I said. It's coffee, Monroe said. I went in the other room, found a half pint of Heaven Hill between the mattress and the wall where I must have hit it before I tapped out. Pretty slick for how drunk I was. I'd, I'd taken it in the coffee pot and mixed half and half with some milk in it for the sake of my stomach. Leave me some, Monroe said. I hadn't said a word. He must have smelt it. He tipped the bottle, took half of what was left. The hell, I said. What you making anyway? Naked lady. Monroe said. I taken a look, and it was the shape of a woman setting on a mess of clay. Monroe made a number of these things at the time. And some he kept, and the rest he thrown out. Never could tell the difference myself. That's all right, I said. No, it ain't, Monroe said. Soon as I made her mouth, she started asking me for stuff. She wants new clothes, she wants a new car, and she wants some jewelry and a pair of Italian boots. And if I made her that stuff, Monroe said, I know she'd just be going to take it out looking for some other fool. I'd be set here all day making stuff I don't care for, and she'll just be out riding and riding. Don't make her no clothes and she can't leave, I said. She'll whine if I do that, Monroe said. The whole time you was asleep, she's been fussing about our relationship. You know the worst thing, Monroe said. If I just even thought about making another naked lady, I know she would purely raise hell. Why don't you make her a naked man and forget it, I said. Why don't I just do this, Monroe said. He whopped the naked lady with his fist and turned this into flat clay pancake which Monroe put in a plastic bag to keep soft. He could hit a good lick when he wanted. Uh, I hear this is uh, common among sculptors. Don't you feel like doing something? Monroe said. I ain't got the least dime, I said. I got a couple of dollars, he said. Let's go see if it might be any gas in the truck. There was some. See, we had this old truck. It, it went too bad, except it was slow to start. And when, and once we got it going, we drove over to this pool hall in Antioch when nobody didn't know us. We stayed a while and taught some fellers that were there how to play rotation and, and five in the side and some other games Monroe was good at. When this was over and we had money, I thought we might go over to the ringside to watch the fights. This was a bar with a ring in the middle so you could sit there and drink and watch people get hurt 
We got in early enough to take seats right under the ropes. There was an exhibition, but it wasn't much, and Monroe started in on this little girl that was sitting by herself at the next table. Hey there, juicy fruit, he said. Come on over here and get some real good. I wouldn't, I told him, having just thought of what was obvious. Then this big old hairy thing came out from the back, sat down at her table. I know him from the poster out front. He was the champion of some kind of karate and had come all the way up from Atlanta just to beat someone to death, and I didn't think he would care if it was Monroe. So I got, I got Monroe out, the, out of there. I was so annoyed with him because I thought I'd, I would have admired to see them fights if I could do it without being in one myself. So, Monroe said he wanted to hear music. And we went someplace where they had that. He kept after the girls, but they wasn't any trouble beyond what we could handle. After a while, these places closed, and we found us a little railroad bar down on a Lower Broad. There wasn't nobody there but the pitifulest band you ever heard, and six bikers, the, the big, ugly, fat kind. They wasn't the Hell's Angels, but I believe they would have done until some came along. I would have left if it was just me. Monroe played pool with one, and lost. It wouldn't have happened if he hadn't have been drunk. He did have a better eye than me, which may be why he's a sculptor and I'm a second-rate pool player. How come all the fat boys in this joint got on black leather jackets? Monroe hollered out. Could that be a new way to lose weight? The one he'd played with come bellying over. See, these boys like to look you up and down beforehand to see if you might faint, but Monroe hooked this one side the head. He went down like a steer in the slaughterhouse. That, that didn't make me happy as it might have because it was five of them and that one was that was down. I thought I'd have to get up shortly. So I shoved Monroe out the door and told him to go start the truck. The band had done left already and i thrown a chair and i threw some other stuff that was laying around and I ducked out myself. The truck wasn't started yet and it was close behind. It was this uh, old Fort 10 I had under the seat that somebody had sawed a foot off the barrel. I take it and I shot the sidewalk in front of these boys. The pattern was wide on account of the barrel being short like it was, and I believe some of it must have hit him. It was a pump. I took three shells. I kept two back in the case, you know, in case I needed them for serious. But Monroe got the truck going, and we left out of there. I was so mad at Monroe. Never said a word to him till he parked outside the mill. It was a nice moon up and throwing shadows in the cab when the headlights went out. I turned the shotgun across the seat and laid it into Monroe's ribs. What you up to? he said. You might want to die, I said, but I don't believe I want to go with you. I pumped the gun to where he could hear the shell fall into the chamber. If that's what you want, just tell me now. I'll save us both some trouble. It ain't what I want, Monroe said. I take the gun off him. I don't know what I do want, Monroe said. Go up there and make a naked lady and you'll feel better, I told him. He was messing with clay when I went to sleep, but that ain't what he'd done. He, was, he set up a mirror and done ahead of himself instead. I taken a look at the thing in the morning. It was a fair likeness. It looked looking like it was thinking about all the foolish things Monroe had gotten up to in his life so far. That same day, he'd done one of me that was so real, it looked like it had a hangover. Ugly, too, but that ain't Monroe's fault. He's making money with it now. How we finally fixed them rats was we, we brought on a snake. Monroe was the one who had the idea. It was a good size one, and when it had just ate a rat, it was as big round as your arm. It didn't eat more than about one a week, but appeared to cause the rest of them to lay low. You might say it was as bad to have snakes around as rats, but at least it was only the one snake. The only thing was, when it turned cold, the old snake wanted to get into bed with you. See, snakes ain't naturally warm like we are, and, and that's come how people think they're slimy. It's not the truth once you get to know one. This old snake, he just comes and goes when the spirit moves him. I ain't seen him in a while, but I expect he must still be around.
The end. Locked in a Vacancy is produced in collaboration with Stories Telling Stories and STS Media Group. Socially isolating itself at Milt House Studios in Milton, Vermont. Casting around the globe to your frontal lobe wherever podcasts are found. Locked in a Vacancy is also streaming on YouTube at Stories Telling Stories. Make sure to give us a review wherever you stream our show. We really appreciate it. Make sure to follow us on Facebook and Instagram and give us a subscribe on YouTube. And consider supporting us on Patreon for as little as a dollar a month. I'm Eric R. Hill, proud Vermonter, and until next time, stay whimsical. Jeez, I'm crow, I think I done it. Fucking A right there, boss.